Laudato Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. Today, Monday, April 19th, is the feast of Pope St. Leo IX. And these are today's headlines. On Good Shepherd Sunday, Pope Francis is set to ordain nine men to the priesthood for the Diocese of Rome. Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany are preparing for a summit to address ongoing hostilities in eastern Ukraine. And the bishops of Costa Rica have organized a day of prayer for all those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells. Pope Francis is expected to ordain nine deacons to the priesthood at St. Peter's Basilica on Sunday, April 25th. All nine of them are currently on retreat in preparation for their priestly ordination. Father Benedict Mayaki has the story. Pope Francis will ordain nine deacons to the priesthood at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican on the 25th of April, which coincides with the liturgical celebration of Good Shepherd Sunday. The Mass, which will begin at 9 a.m., will be broadcast live on Vatican Media and on the Facebook page of the Diocese of Rome. In-person participation at the ordinations will be strictly in compliance with COVID-19 health regulations, including body temperature checks, wearing of masks, and hand sanitization. A statement issued on Monday by the press office of the Vicariate of Rome said that the deacons are currently observing a spiritual retreat at a monastery in preparation for their ordination. All nine of the deacons studied in various diocesan seminaries. Six of them, George Marius Bogdan, Salvatore Marco Montone, Manuel Secchi, Diego Armando Barrera Para, Salvatore Lucchesi, and Giorgio Di Iuri, were formed at the Pontifical Roman Major Seminary. Two others, Ricardo Shendamo and Samuel Piermarini, studied at the Diocesan Redemptorist Matar College, while Matteo Enrique Atai de Cruz was trained at the Seminary of Our Lady of Divine Love. The statement from the Vicariate of Rome also provided some insights into the personal stories of the deacons. For example, George Marius Bogdan from Romania said that his desire to become a priest was inspired by a book that he read when he was nine years old on the life of St. John Bosco, the founder of the Salesians. Diego Armando Barrera Para from Colombia volunteered since high school at a juvenile prison and in a foundation for drug addicts. There, he says, my desire to be able to help and serve others forever was born. Meanwhile, 43-year-old Salvatore Lucchesi, who hails from Sicily, gives thanks to God for his call to him during his adolescence when he moved to Rome for university studies. In prayer, he says, I had a direct experience of the fact that the Lord was there and did not ask anything of me. This is the grace, the free love of God. I'm Father Benedict Mayaki. <laughs> Turning to world news, top advisors to the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany have begun consultations on holding a possible summit aimed at easing tensions over the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. The proposed meeting comes amid a massive Russian military buildup near Ukraine's borders. At the same time, in the eastern part of Ukraine, government forces are battling against Russian-backed separatists. Stefan Boss has the latest. Monday's talks come after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, French counterpart Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel urged Russia to end a troop buildup near the Ukrainian border. They are also worried about an increased Russian troops presence on Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula, which Moscow annexed in 2014. The stationing of tens of thousands of Russian troops along Ukraine's borders comes as a fragile ceasefire agreement between government forces and Moscow-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine has unraveled in recent weeks. That has enormous consequences for Ukrainian soldiers hiding in trenches on the front lines in eastern Ukraine. <laughs> They are flying right over us, this soldier says about the shootings. They are trying to provoke something when they shoot at us with machine guns and assault rifles. It is not clear why. Another soldier says, watch this. This provocation is happening again. 
At least 30 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in this area since the start of the year. As fighting continues, Ukrainian President Zelensky seeks four-way talks on easing tensions under the so-called Normandy format. That format involves Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany. Both France and Germany have been mediators in the Ukraine conflict since 2015. Ukraine's president, who visited his troops on the front lines, also wants an all-for-all all prisoner exchange with separatist forces in the east of the country. Kiev views a ceasefire as a precondition for implementing the Minsk peace agreements for eastern Ukraine negotiated earlier. A truce could also lead to other aspects of the Minsk agreements, such as local elections in the separatist-controlled Donbas area and control of the Ukrainian-Russian border. Ukraine's government and Western allies fear that without a new ceasefire, tensions could further rise in a region where the seven-year conflict has killed more than 14,000 people. For Vatican Radio, I am Stefan Bos, reporting. Elsewhere in world news, Syrians will be called to cast their ballots next month in the country's second presidential election since the start of a devastating civil war in 2011. Linda Bordoni has the latest. The announcement was made by the Parliament Speaker on Sunday, who set the 26th of May as Election Day. In a statement, the Speaker also said Syrians abroad will be able to vote at embassies on the 20th of May. Prospective candidates, he added, can hand in their applications from today, but they must have lived in Syria continuously for at least 10 years. This means that opposition figures in exile fighting to end decades of Assad family rule will not be able to stand. Millions of refugees displaced by the 10-year conflict will also not be eligible to cast their votes. President Bashar al-Assad, who took power following the death of his father, Hafez, in the year 2000, has not yet officially announced he will stand for re-election, but he is expected to do so. He won the previous election in 2014, three years after a violent crackdown on anti-government protesters and amid the raging conflict. At the time, he was given nearly 90% of the vote. Since then, Russia's military intervention has helped Assad to regain large swaths of land from opposition fighters, who now control a small pocket of land in the country's northwestern region. Assad's Ba'ath Party won an expected majority in Syria's parliamentary elections last year, denounced as undemocratic by the opposition. And next month's poll is widely seen as most likely to keep the current president in power. I'm Linda Bordoni. Briefly, in other world news, security forces in Myanmar used violence on Monday against demonstrators who sought to celebrate last week's formation of a shadow government to serve as an alternative to the military junta that has held power since a February coup. Myanmar media and posts on social networks said the violence was especially intense in Myingyan, a town in central Myanmar, where the online news site the Irrawaddy reported at least one person was killed Sunday, with unconfirmed reports on social media suggesting another person was killed there on Monday. An Albanian man with a knife attacked five people Monday at a mosque in the capital of Tirana, according to police. A police statement said Rudolf Nikoli entered the Dini Khosna Mosque in downtown Tirana about 2.30 p.m. and wounded five people with a knife. Police reacted immediately and took him into custody. And Cuba's ruling Communist Party elected President Miguel Diaz-Canel to succeed Raul Castro as party first secretary, the most powerful position in the country, on the final day of its Congress on Monday. That's according to the state-run news agency Prensa Latina. Elsewhere in the Americas, a network of indigenous peoples organizations of Amazonia has raised an alarm that their rights are being increasingly threatened, with one indigenous rights defender killed every two days. The coordinator of indigenous organizations of the Amazon River Basin, 
known by its acronym COICA, declared a human rights emergency for indigenous defenders of the Amazon and have demanded justice. Robin Gomes has this report. The coordinator of indigenous organizations of the Amazon River Basin, or COECA, a body that oversees nine indigenous organizations of the region, raised the alarm last week, noting a 67% increase in the number of murders of indigenous rights leaders in 2020 compared to 2019. In the Declaration of Emergency of Human Rights for Indigenous Defenders of the Amazon, Blood in the Jungle, We Demand Justice, launched on April the 14th, COECA stated that in 2020, there were 202 murders of leaders who worked in the defense of the territory, environment and the rights of indigenous peoples in countries like Colombia, Brazil, Peru and Bolivia. This would mean that every two days on average an indigenous rights defender dies in the Amazonia. In 2019, 135 indigenous environmental and land rights activists lost their lives. The dramatic increase in murders in the context of the pandemic has put indigenous defenders and their communities at risk, while putting the world's largest rainforest and the biodiversity we protect at risk, said Jose Gregorio Diaz Mirabal, coordinator general of COICA. He demanded that governments and international bodies take actions to protect defenders and communities, otherwise they would become accomplices of an ethnocide. Goika pointed out that the trend has not ended with 2020. In the first quarter of 2021, at least 16 indigenous rights defenders were murdered in Colombia and Peru. The COECA declaration came days ahead of the 20th session of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues that kicks off on Monday. The April 19th to 31st session has as its theme, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, the role of the Indigenous Peoples in Implementing Sustainable Development Goal 16. I am Robin Gomes. Finally, in Central America, the bishops of Costa Rica are organizing a day of prayer this April 22nd for all those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Lydia O'Kane has this report. A special day of prayer for the situation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic will take place on the 22nd of April in Costa Rica. The goal of the initiative, which has been organized by the country's bishops' conference, is to express the Church's solidarity with the entire population. In a statement, the bishops write, We appeal to the responsibility of all, because only together can we overcome this serious disease, and we will succeed in doing so if we faithfully respect the hygienic and sanitary measures established by the authorities. So far, the country has reported at least 229,000 cases and over 3,000 deaths. There are also concerns at the growing rates of infections. For this reason, the Bishops' Conference is urging the population to redouble its efforts to avoid overload and the collapse of health systems, adding, it is important to be aware of the seriousness of not taking the necessary action to stop the spread of the virus. At the same time, the National Catholic Church is asking priests of all parish communities in the country to organize and promote the Day of Prayer, saying that the liturgical commission will also provide an appropriate subsidy as soon as possible. Concluding their statement, the bishops offer their prayers for all the victims of the pandemic and invoke the Lord to give strength and consolation to their families, relatives and friends. I'm Lydia O'Kane. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Vatican and World News. Many thanks today go to our producers and to our technicians in studio. In the Vatican, I'm Christopher Wells.